Welcome everybody. Welcome back to this second day of this summer school. And today uh, it's a great pleasure to have Andrea Ferrara uh, from the Scuola Normale Superior in Pisa. Uh, Andrea had a stellar career with numerous prizes. Is also a joint professorship at RPMU in Tokyo. And today he will speak about a theoretical perspective on the ISM of galaxies. And the floor is yours. And um... thank you. Thank you, Nicola. Um, so good morning, good afternoon, or good evening, everyone. I uh, hope you're well, you're enjoying the school. Um, so my name is uh, Andrea Ferrara and uh, Nicola said I'm, uh, I'm working as a professor at the Scuola Normale Superiore in Pisa in Italy and um, I'm teaching uh, cosmology essentially and, and astrophysics. So uh, today I'd like to, to introduce you to uh, the theoretical uh, aspects of the interstellar medium and the title of my talk, uh, if I would have given this talk about 10 years ago, the title of my talk would have been simply First Galaxies, right? Because 10 years ago, uh, uh, the, the field was really starting with the advent of uh, new instrumentation and, and better detectors. So uh, First Galaxies, looking for the First Galaxy, try to uh, statistically characterize the, these populations uh, that of galaxies that form uh, saying the first billionaire of the universe was really uh, the, uh, the, the, the frontier of the field. But today I'm here giving a different uh, title uh, to my talk. And it's uh, the interstellar medium of the first galaxies. And so this is uh, quite a, a feature because um, in principle to, uh, to understand and study the interstellar medium of such distant galaxies is really something that uh, probably we would never even hope to, to do at this time. But indeed, uh, we are again uh, on the next frontier and the interstellar medium of the first galaxies is the first frontier. So we can now study this component of the, uh, of the uh, systems, uh, of the cosmic systems in, a, in quite a detail. So what I would like to uh, do to discuss in this lecture is a theoretical perspective uh, for the uh, ISM of the first galaxy. We will understand why this is important and what are the questions that we need to ask. So let me go uh, straight to define exactly what I mean by, by uh, early galaxies or first galaxies, if you prefer. Um, and, and in order to do so, I need to introduce a little bit of a cosmic timeline of the universe. So uh, as we know, the, the, the universe, uh, was left by uh, the process of uh, recombination by which an electron and a proton combined to form an hydrogen atom uh, and therefore uh, being the neutral state at redshift of about 1000. And so when the temperature was around, around 3000 K. Uh, so the universe was left in this neutral state and essentially was a vast sea of uh, hydrogen and helium uh, with no light. So there were no sources of light that were uh, shining onto this gas. And so we had to wait uh, until a uh, redshift of the order of uh, 40, that is several hundred million years after the Big Bang, in order to see the first generation of stars that we usually call population three stars because they're uh, essentially metal free. So they reflect the composition of the universe at that time. Uh, and these pop three stars, uh, uh, we're starting to uh, produce ionizing photons, produce heavy elements, and so they change the structure and the composition uh, of the universe in a very uh, dramatic way until uh, they, they uh, combine in larger and larger galaxies. And altogether, the stars in these galaxies produce what we call the uh, reionization. So a gradual process by which the hydrogen is turned into an ionized state again. So this is the epoch of reionization and it's supposed to end uh, within the first billion year from the Big Bang. So today, I'd like to uh, discuss with you what are the properties of the interstellar medium of galaxies that were formed in the first billion year of the universe. 
Um, the, the, there are other talks that are uh, discussed in the ISM uh, at lower redshift uh, at the school. And uh, uh, of course, this is uh, somewhat more, uh, somewhat, somewhat easier to, to study because these galaxies are closer or brighter. Uh, uh, and, and so we can study uh, structure formation along with their interstellar medium. So uh, before we enter into, into the uh, details and the features of the interstellar medium of early galaxies, let uh, have a, 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 an overall view of the uh, ISM in general uh, of any galaxy, but with some specific features that are related to the high redshift galaxy now. So this is a, a, just a comprehensive picture that is meant to show how complicated the interstellar medium could be and how much uh, physics can be involved in determining its properties. In particular, we know that the interstellar medium is a, is a multi-phase. Uh, by, by that, I mean that there are regions of gas with different thermodynamical properties in terms of density, temperature, ionization, uh, ionization fraction, um, and also composition. Some are uh, neutral, some are ionized, and some are molecular. Um, uh, so these are different phases of the ISM, uh, and the, most of the energetics of the ISM is regulated by young stars, which inject uh, energy in form of mechanical uh, and radiative forms. Uh, they also produce ionization and heating of the interstellar medium, and they regulate the formation of, uh, of uh, molecules. Then uh, supernovae uh, also are very important because they produce uh, heavy elements again, energy, they inject turbulence, cosmic rays, uh, and also dust, the dust grains that uh, may be formed in the uh, ejecta of this um, first supernovae. And the entire ISM is permeated by the interstellar radiation field that is produced by uh, the collective emission from the stars and the magnetic fields that are also uh, participating to the uh, pressure and dynamics of the, of the uh, ISM. Uh, all this is, uh, is a very uh, complicated uh, structure uh, that is essentially produced, uh, regulated by uh, turbulence, uh, there are outflows, and particularly at high redshift, another important component is the uh, fact that uh, the, uh, the cosmic microwave background uh, is permeating uh, the, the galaxies and therefore regulates, sets a floor essentially to the uh, temperature of uh, any um, atomic species, and uh, that is in thermal, thermal equilibrium with the cosmic microwave background. So now, uh, the, the, uh, this, is the, this is the outline of the lecture then, with this uh, short introduction. What I want to cover is, uh, the fir is first uh, a very brief um, overview of the properties of the first galaxies. And so we, uh, we derive from first principle what are the expected uh, uh, physical processes or, or physical properties of these galaxies and the important physics that is shaping their, uh, their uh, appearance. Um, we will that, uh, then have a break point for, for questions. And then we will uh, understand why the different the properties of these early galaxies, which are definitely different from the ones that we see around us today, uh, may uh, imply that their interstellar medium is also different in several uh, aspects. Um, and so once we have learned and uh, we have understood this from the theoretical point of view, we will also compare our understanding with the uh, phenomenology of, um, of these uh, first uh, early systems. So this is the plan. Uh, so uh, let, me, let me start by from the very beginning. So we need to understand uh, why early galaxies were different from uh, the ones that we see today. So this is the main uh, target of the talk of the lecture during the first part. So why are these galaxies different, uh, different from the ones that we see today? And what does, this, what does that mean? So in order to understand this, we need to uh, recall that um, at the very beginning, just after the recombination, uh, the universe was left in a very homogeneous state with very tiny fluctuation of the order of one per 100,000. Uh, and so this initial fluctuation were imprinted by 
possibly inflation. And uh, these fluctuations were left uh, to grow under the action of gravity. And so uh, the map that you see there is a temperature map that be can be translated into a density map, which is a, a picture from the CMB of the universe as it was at the recombination epoch, so over to 1000. Now we can uh, define uh, the uh, density contrast between the mean density rho, uh, uh, rho and the actual density, which is the uh, which is the density that is present in each of these fluctuations. It could be positive or negative, but it's this density contrast delta has to be much less than one in order to apply uh, linear theory. So rather than working in linear, linear space, in a real space, we tend to work in Fourier space. And that means that we can write down what is called the Gene's equation, which is the one that you, that you, see, uh, that you see here, uh, if, uh, if you see my cursor. So uh, delta K, so is the Fourier transform of delta. And so the, uh, the equation that regulates the growth of uh, the density contrast under the action of gravity and uh, in, uh, an internal thermal pressure, it's written here. So we have a term, which is a second derivative of delta. And then we have the, uh, the Hubble constant because all this has to, has to occur in a universe which is expanding. And so this is exactly why H, the Hubble constant is appearing there. And on the right hand side, as a source terms for, for delta, we have uh, the competing action of two terms. The one on the left, which is the gravity uh, that you can easily recognize by the fact that the density appears there, density rho. And we also have um, a, a competing term, which is the uh, internal pressure, thermal pressure uh, in the fluctuation that is given by uh, the CS squared term, uh, that where CS is the sound speed of, of the gas. So uh, if you uh, essentially say that these two terms are equal, then you can uh, derive what is an important length, which is called the Jeans length, uh, lambda j, which is written here, which is nothing else than two pi over the Jeans wave number. And uh, if you work out this uh, simple uh, equation up there, you find that uh, lambda j is equal to this quantity, which is the sound speed times a quantity, which is nothing else than the free fall time. So you can think of the genes length as the, uh, the, uh, the distance that the sound wave can uh, travel in a free fall time. And this is the where equilibrium uh, between gravity and pressure can be achieved. Uh, connected to lambda j, you can build up also a genes mass, which is nothing else than four, four pi thirds uh, times the lambda j cube. Uh, and uh, if, you, if you substitute the uh, cosmic evolution of the density, you find that this uh, redshift uh, independent uh, uh, quantity, which is called the, uh, the genes mass during the uh, matter dominated epoch of the universe. Uh, in that case, the genes mass uh, is a constant. It's of the order of uh, about 10 to the six solar masses. If you take for the density parameter of baryons, the standard value of uh, uh, 0 0.04 and h square is the, uh, the reducible constant. So uh, this, is the, uh, this, is, this mass sets essentially the, uh, the size of the very first uh, gravitating uh, system. So the, you may think it very uh, broadly as the, uh, the typical size uh, of, the, of the first galaxy, just to have uh, an estimate. Now, uh, so we have this growth uh, that is, uh, so far we have considered only the, the linear growth of, of, this, uh, of this perturbation. But of course, at some point, the density constant will become larger than one. And so we enter the so-called nonlinear growth that leads to the formation of uh, uh, self-gravitated structures in dark matter that we call dark matter halos. So, uh, 
the, uh, the, uh, the way to uh, compute this is very simple. Uh, this is explained in, in many uh, textbooks, so I'm going uh, rather fast here. So if you have a spherical perturbation, what you, you have to do is just essentially to write down uh, the uh, energy conservation that uh, says that the radius of the perturbation uh, is uh, shrinking or expanding depending on, on the, on the uh, on the relative balance with the gravity, which is given by the GM over R term. So uh, this uh, differential equation has a simple solution in terms of a, a parametric form where theta is a parameter. So the radius of your uh, pertur initial perturbation, that was Ri, changes with time uh, uh, according to, uh, to this uh, set of uh, equations. This is the expression for R, this is the expression for time. They both depend on theta. And so you can find also a, a relation between R and T, which is shown here in the, in the upper figure. So you see that according to the linear theory, the uh, radius of the perturbation, uh, according to the equation that we had in the previous slide, could continue to grow. But actually, due to the nonlinear evolution, it reaches a maximum, and then under the action of gravity, it falls down and uh, actually collapses into a point. So uh, when theta is equal to pi, then uh, delta, the density contrast, should go to infinity. While if you if you would have used the uh, linear theory, then uh, this point would be uh, corresponding to. Uh, uh, a value of the density contrast of essentially 1.68. Now, uh, actually, uh, uh, this is a, 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 an ideal situation because in practice, the system doesn't reach a, a, a r equals zero. So it doesn't become a point like a, a singularity. But because of a process that is called virialization, that implies that the orbits of the dark matter particle, which is collisionless, uh, change then uh, it reaches a, a given saturation point that you see in the bottom panel. So again, you, you have a, your perturbation that uh, has a radius that initially grows and then collapses onto itself. It doesn't go to zero, but actually goes to some uh, flat uh, constant value, which is nothing else than uh, 18 pi squared. So this is the reason for which we say that we realize dark matter halos are on average 200 times denser than the cosmic mean. Remember that delta is the density contrast, so with respect to the mean, okay? So uh, about 200 times denser than the cosmic mean. So these halos, which are, you can think as, as the nonlinear evolution of the fluctuation that lead to the formation of uh, uh, self-gravitating uh, dark matter structure onto which the baryons fall, and uh, these halos have, on average, a density which is 200 times denser than the mean. Now, with all this in mind, uh, then you can find very uh, simple relation, and we are starting to see, uh, to get to some uh, interesting point here. So uh, the, this formula here are simply using the, uh, the, the equation that I showed you before and the, and the uh, methodology of using the, uh, the nonlinear collapse of uh, fluctuation to determine, uh, to determine the three key quantities that determine the properties of a dark matter halo. These are the radius, which is called the virial radius because of the realization process that I told you before. Then we also have the, uh, the velocity that you can simply obtain by uh, as a gm over r. Gm over Rv, actually. And also, you have uh, a, a virial temperature that you can get by transforming the, uh, the velocity into a temperature. And so, these are standard formulas, so I'm not spending too much time. But um, what is important, you have a factor here that depends on cosmology, uh, because you see that delta C is uh, uh, essentially, uh, is, uh, this is a fit to the to an actual solution. And uh, so it depends on the relative uh, abundance of dark matter with respect to the, um, to the dark energy or the cosmological constant, if you prefer. So the, the cosmology is into this term. But what I'm interested to show here is that uh, if you take a halo mass with a fixed, uh, well, so if you take a halo with a fixed mass, 
Then uh, the dependence on redshift that you see here in these three quantities imply that if uh, for a fixed halo mass at high redshift, halos are smaller because you see that there is a the inverse dependence of redshift one plus z to the minus one, uh, have larger circular velocity, dependence of uh, square root of one plus z, and they have larger virial temperatures linear dependence on one plus z. So now as, as, as if for an, as an example, if we consider a Milky Way like halo, which typically has a, uh, a, the, the Milky Way is contained in a halo uh, with mass of 10 to the 12 solar masses or so. So for a Milky Way like halo, if you put it, uh, if the, that halo exists, a redshift seven say, so in the uh, epoch of realization, then it would have a virial radius, which is 21 kiloparsec, would have a virial velocity of 450 kilometers per second, and the virial temperature, which is seven times seven million K. And these are values that are exactly as I was saying before, uh, very different from the one that we observe in the Milky Way. So in general, the, the, uh, the halo properties of high redshift galaxies are very much different from the ones that we see today. And as we will see, this is, forms the basis for the differences also in the interstellar medium. Now let's make another step and, and say, all right, so we have, uh, so far we have uh, talked about dark matter. And so you may wonder, what about the barriers? What about the gas? Okay, so we have uh, uh, made step one. We have a halo. We can predict exactly what are the property or the property of such a halo. And then what happens? Well, one day, once the halo is formed, uh, it will continue to, uh, to do, it will grow in two different ways. The first is by accreting matter from, uh, that is still maybe in the linear regime. So it's still essentially diffuse matter, uh, which is essentially at the, at the mean density, or it can also uh, combine with other nonlinear structures, other uh, dark matter halos, and therefore this is what we call a merger. So, uh, so the, the, the halo itself grows and also acquires baryons in this way uh, because they come together with the dark matter. And so because these halos are also rotating, I'll come back to this point later, then you would expect that uh, at the center of the halo, uh, the gas cool, uh, can uh, uh, settle down uh, and form a, a disk. And within a disk, this is where the action takes place. So uh, within the disk, this, uh, the, the gas that is uh, uh, falling onto, onto, settling down on the disk uh, is what we call the, 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 the essentially the interstellar medium. And the inter this such interstellar medium can cool due to different processes that we analyze later, uh, can form stars, and the stars uh, can produce both ionizing photons and uh, deposit mechanical energy, as we were discussing before, in, in, in a single word, feedback. Uh, and feedbacks may also drive outflows. And so this is a, this is a cycle that regulates the, life, the lifetime uh, and the evolution of the, of the galaxy. Of course, you can also have uh, that uh, within this galaxy, you can find black holes, in particular also supermassive black holes that they drive their own jets and wings. And so this is a, a yet another type of feedback, but today I will not go into that. Now, uh, I said that the, the halo uh, grows by uh, accreting uh, in two ways. So the first one is by accreting matter. So how does that work and what are the implications for that? Okay, we have the, our structure, which we call the halo, which is the blue line. And around the halo, there is the intergalactic medium, uh, which is everything that is still in the linear phase. Remember that the halo is in the nonlinear phase of the evolution. But the intergalactic medium, it's uh, low density gas and dark matter. Uh, that is, uh, uh, and the gas in particular as a given temperature, which is uh, TIGM, which is regulated by uh, any energy input that is uh, produced by galaxies or other sources into it. So uh, because the, the halo represents a, a potential well, then uh, the gas in the linear phase tends to uh, fall down onto, onto the halo itself. And it does so 
at uh, a velocity which is of the order of the virial, virial velocity they have introduced before. And most of the time, particularly at high redshift, this is a, a supersonic velocity with respect to the intergalactic medium. And so as soon as the, the gas enters within the virial radius uh, and is uh, stopped by, uh, uh, by its velocity, is turned into uh, thermal energy by a shock. And so there is a shock that is transforming the kinetic energy of the gas into thermal energy of the gas. And so the internal part of the halo gets up to a higher temperature that we call Ts, and Rs is the radius of the shock. So uh, now, uh, as this hot gas uh, is produced by the shock, it will naturally uh, tend to cool down. Uh, because there are many uh, species uh, that can uh, get excited uh, and produce uh, lines or continuum that carries away uh, the, uh, the energy via radiation. And so this is expressed by the cooling function. I will come back later. Don't, don't worry about the details now. So we have a function that, uh, depending on uh, the amount of uh, AV elements that you have, because AV elements are the main sources of cooling for the gas, then uh, uh, these are uh, shown here. You can have as a function of temperature a certain rate of losses via radiation. And so that defines an important quantity, which is the cooling time. So the cooling time is the time that it takes to radiate away the entire thermal energy of the, of the gas. And therefore it's proportional to the ratio of uh, uh, KT, which is the internal energy over the radiative losses, which is the density time this function lambda that is shown here. So now if the cooling time is very short, so as soon as the hot gas is, is, is formed, then it cools down. So in, in the limit in which uh, the cooling time is infinitely short, then the, the, there will be essentially no, no hot gas because it has cooled so rapidly that as soon as you produce it, it cools down. Then in that case, uh, this is an unstable situation. Uh, because uh, the hot gas has the function to, to block the, and, and support the pressure that is coming from the infalling gas. So uh, you can derive, and this has been done by Birmo and Deckel in 2003, the condition for the shock to be stable and therefore to have uh, some, some uh, hot gas at the center of your, of your halo. But the, the stability condition is, is uh, written in this formula, and it has only a weak dependence on redshift. So you can forget about uh, a galaxy being uh, at any redshift. This is true anywhere, essentially, apart from a tiny independence. Now, it turns out that halos that are uh, smaller than the Milky Way, uh, so smaller than 10 to the 12 solar massive, uh, have, uh, uh, they cannot support a hot phase at the center because the, gas, the, the cooling is too efficient to, to maintain a stable uh, shock there. And so uh, they don't satisfy the stability uh, condition that is written there. Instead, what happens is that uh, they have a cold accretion. That means that all the info ray that is flowing down from the, uh, from the cosmological scales is immediately brought into the very center of the, of the galaxy. This is what we call cold accretion, the opposite case in which actually there is this hot uh, bubble at the center that is blocking the accretion uh, from the cosmological scales is instead called hot accretion. And that refers to, uh, to larger galaxy, larger halos with masses larger than 10 to the 12. Uh, at high redshift, essentially, you can forget about that mode. The only mode that matters is the cold accretion, and therefore, uh, we will analyze this uh, in, the, in the next um, uh, slides. So uh, before I go into that discussion, though, recall that there is also a second way in which the halos can grow other than accretion. I told you there are also halo mergers, so merging of two nonlinear structures to dark matter halos. And uh, so they collect other smaller halos. So uh, uh, representation of this process as a function of redshift. So if you go from early times, redshift 10 or so, up to redshift zero, uh, the present day. So we follow one halo. For example, suppose that this is the Milky Way. Okay, So at the end of the day, redshift zero, you get the Milky Way. 
And as you go uh, in the function of time, you see that uh, this main branch, which is what we see today as the galaxy or the Milky Way in my, in my example, uh, has been uh, growing by the fact uh, in a way that it's with accretion, but also uh, due to the fact that there are some uh, uh, merger hail er other halos that are merging with this uh, main branch and they bring their own mass. So the mass is, is coded here by uh, the color bar. And so you see that this is con continuous growth of, of the halo as it uh, new and new uh, halos that are every single point here are uh, merging with this uh, main halo that we have. So this is the way in which we understand and this is obtained from a simulation, but you can also uh, derive it uh, from uh, very simple uh, analytical uh, methods. So we know how to describe very well the halo merging, we know how to describe very well the accretion rate, and so we have all the ingredients to understand how a galaxy, or at least the uh, the, 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 the dark matter halo uh, part of the, of the galaxy grows with time, very so it's a bit more complicated. Now, I told you that what matters uh, is accretion and mergers. And in particular, I told you that accretion, uh, the mode of accretion that matters is the cold accretion mode in which there is no shock and the uh, matter is brought into the halo by the cosmological filaments. You, you, you may have seen that the, uh, the gravity forms uh, uh, a, a cosmic uh, web uh, type of uh, structure which is made of filaments and voids and so galaxies are connected to other galaxies a little bit like a, a neural network uh, and the galaxies have their mass that is brought by uh, it's not a uniform accretion but the, the, the accretion mostly of course in filaments which are typically three or four per, per galaxy essentially and so uh, this is the dominant accretion mode for uh, halos at high Z. So you can compute exactly uh, from the cosmological conditions, what is the accretion rate that comes uh, onto a given halo of mass M and that branch of Z. And you can express this accretion rate Tm by dt uh, also as a function of the Hubble constant of that ratio. So this is a very simple compact expression that, that is uh, rather accurate um, and has been also tested uh, against uh, uh, numerical simulations. So this is a very nice way to um, find how galaxies grow due to uh, accretion rate. Now this accretion rate also includes the merger. So it's a uh, it's, uh, total accretion rate I should say, to be precise, but uh, um, if you want to know how the galaxy grow, you can use this formula. Now, it turns out something uh, that something uh, very peculiar occurs that, uh, again, uh, if you take our Milky Way and we put it at redshift 7, then uh, the Milky Way at that time would accrete gas at the prodigious rate of uh, 1200 solar masses per year. So this is really uh, amazing, particularly if you compare it with the estimated uh, present day accretion rate of the galaxy of the Milky Way, which is of the order of three to five solar masses. So if you have a halo like the one in, uh, in which we live in at Regis 7, then the, the accretion rate would be much, much higher. And therefore uh, this has important implication. So this is a, uh, another different difference uh, with respect to uh, present day galaxies. So accretion and it comes from cosmology essentially. So we have already seen two things that are uh, related to cosmology. So the, the uh, typical uh, virial radii are smaller, accretion rates are higher. So these are two important things that you need to keep in mind when you try to model uh, the interstellar medium of high-redshift galaxies for reasons that I explain later on. Now we are just collecting all these pieces and then we will put them together. So accretion rates are much more vigorous at high redshift. Good. Now, uh, uh, as the gas settles down in the, in the halo, uh, because the halo is rotating and 
we have uh, good uh, uh, ideas about that, then uh, it's very likely, and we see this in, in simulations like the one that uh, I'm showing up there uh, in the, the figure. So uh, a disk will form. So what are the properties of this disk and how can we use them to predict the, um, the interstellar medium of this galaxy? Well, one quantity which is uh, uh, very useful in, in this, uh, in, to, to determine to, or to quantify uh, rotation is the so-called the halo spin parameter. So uh, what is it? Uh, well, formally it's, uh, it's uh, defined in the, the top line here where uh, J is the angular momentum of the halo, E is the, uh, energy, the kinetic energy uh, and M is the mass of the halo. So if we write the standard expressions for the halo rotation velocity, Vc, which is J, the angular momentum divided by the mass and the period radius. We write the kinetic energy, which is M uh, times uh, V squared, uh, V virial squared, and also the, uh, the virial velocity that we have introduced before, which is Gm over V. In this case, it represents the maximum velocity that a disk can have because uh, it's the breakout velocity, essentially. So if you substitute this three expression into the definition of lambda uh, in the top line, then you find that lambda is nothing else than uh, the circular velocity of the disk divided the video velocity. So this is the physical interpretation of the spin parameter, very easy. Now, uh, having, uh, uh, of course, in order to know what lambda is, uh, you need to, uh, this is very hard to, to derive from first principle, then you need to do um, essentially numerical simulation because the, the rate at which the halos are rotating is uh, determined by a complex network of uh, tidal interaction among, among these halos. Um, and so uh, it's, it's complicated, but, According to simulations, uh, the, the spin parameter lambda is distributed in a log normal as a log normal form with a mean of 0 0.05 and the, and the spread of uh, variance of uh, uh, RMS of 0 0.5. So if you use this, then you can compute what is the, uh, the, the scale length uh, of the disk, assuming that it's an exponential, for example, but you can do other uh, hypotheses on that. And it turns out that the radius of the, of the disk, Rd, is uh, simply proportional to lambda times the virial radius times uh, uh, the specific moment, the ratio of the specific momentum of the disk normalized to the specific momentum, specific angular momentum of the halo. If you say that the, the two are, are, are equal, then this factor goes to one and you have that Rd is essentially a small fraction of the virial radius, okay? So, but it's linearly proportional. So larger halos host larger uh, disks and what is important is that the radius of the disks, of the galactic disk, because of the dependence of, uh, same dependence of uh, the virial radius on redshift, then it also decreases with one plus Z to the minus one. So that means, and we can conclude, this is a very solid uh, argument that galaxy disks are smaller at high redshift. And this is something that is very well reproducing the uh, results from the observation that we have so far of galactic disk at, uh, uh, at early times. So uh, this is very simple and yet very uh, consistent with, uh, with, uh, with the data. Now, uh, this disk, it's, uh, uh, we have to ask uh, other questions. We can learn more about this disk. Uh, is this stable? So once I have formed the disk, will it survive forever? Will it break down or will it stay uh, like this? So uh, in order to answer this question, we can uh, use the standard theory of uh, thin disks. So we assume that the, the uh, size, the vertical size of the disk is much smaller than, uh, than its radius. 
And then we can use the standard uh, fluido dynamic equations for mass and momentum conservation and the Poisson equation that relates the gravitational potential and the, and the density. Sigma here is the, is the uh, surface density. So it's the uh, mass divided by an area, the surface density of, um, of matter. Now, these are the three linearized equations. So we are looking for perturbation of a disk. So we have a disk and we perturb it with, uh, with some uh, uh, sinusoidal uh, perturbation. And so we look for plane wave solutions that have a frequency omega and wave number k. And we also define omega as uh, the rotational frequency, which is nothing else than the uh, ratio between velocity and radius. Now you get, uh, by doing this with a little bit of math, then uh, you get to a dispersion relation, which relates uh, omega, the frequency, and the wave number k. Um, and we see that uh, in order for this to be stable, so if I perturb the disk, it will, not, uh, uh, the, it will oscillate a bit, but will never break out. The, the, the perturbation will not uh, become unstable. So uh, we have to ask that omega square is larger than zero. And so omega square has a contribution from three physical uh, terms. Uh, the first term is the thermal term. Uh, it's related to the sound speed. Uh, the second one is rotated to rotation and they're both positive. So they are stabilizing terms. Uh, and then we have a gravity turn, which is related uh, to the uh, gravity pool provided by the uh, matter with uh, surface density sigma zero. Now, uh, we can define two uh, characteristic wave numbers, kj and k rot. And kj comes by from dividing the uh, third term by the first one, and k rot by dividing the second one by the third one. Now you can convince yourself, uh, if you think for a second, you can convince yourself that if K rot is larger than Kj, then the condition for stability is satisfied. And so using this definition, uh, we can also show that this is equivalent, uh, K rot larger than Kj is equivalent to impose that the parameter that is called Q, uh, the tumor parameter uh, is less than one. And Q is uh, omega times Cs over pi G sigma zero, uh, the, the uh, mass density. So in this case, if Q is less than one, the disk fragments into clumps. So the disk is unstable. So it will break down and uh, produce uh, denser and denser clumps. Now, why is this important? Well, uh, it is important because we want to know whether this disk that we see, first of all, if we do expect to see disks that are redshift, and also if the disks survive against mergers, because I told you that uh, the uh, other uh, uh, halos are constantly plunging into the main one, and so they can disrupt the, uh, the stability of the disk itself. And this, indeed, this is what we see, uh, for example, in, in simulations, then uh, we see a galaxy, this is a different redshift from 7.21 down to 6.09. Uh, and you see that there are stages in which uh, uh, the galaxy looks like a very nice uh, uh, smooth spiral disk. But there are others in which merges occur, or very strong accretion events, and uh, therefore it becomes more, more clumpy and disturbed. So, uh, so the stability it could be of the disk is hampered both by internal processes like the one that I showed you before or by external processes like, uh, for example, mergers. And both type of uh, processes tend to produce dense clumps and therefore you would expect that they both tend to enhance star formation because stars form where the gas is denser. Now, uh, uh, so the, the, uh, the Q parameter that I introduced before is very important. So in particular for in the interstellar medium because it tell us or gives us a criterion to answer the question where and uh, how the, the, the stars form in a galaxy. 
Now, uh, in, the, in the example that I showed before, uh, I was making uh, some simplifying assumptions. So remember, let me go back uh, to, the, uh, to that expression. So we had here omega times CS, okay? Concentrate on the numerator here. Now, omega is defined like a V over R, and in this formula was assumed to be constant. Uh, and CS was only the uh, thermal, uh, thermal part of the pressure. But you can generalize this formula. And in this case, you get a slightly modified uh, formula. I mean, the expression is the same, but these two quantities at the numerator have changed because now I'm introducing the epicyclic frequency K, which is uh, very closely related to omega, but this is generalized for the case in which omega is a function of the uh, disk radius. So it's a more general form. And for instead of CS here, I have uh, sigma, which also includes uh, possible uh, non-thermal motions. So that are contributing to the pressure that could be, for example, turbulence. Now, uh, one thing that is uh, very important is that this sigma uh, that is participating uh, and ultimately deciding whether this becoming stable or not, and therefore forming stars, uh, can be, uh, it's uh, powered by the accretion. So we have uh, accretion that is kind of accretion of gas from cosmological structure that is coming to the galaxy. And this kinetic energy goes into powering uh, the, uh, the, the velocity dispersion that then enters into the stability of the disk. Now, this uh, sigma uh, can be, uh, can be uh, written in terms of the accretion rate that we, that we uh, that described before. So now this is n dot g and uh, uh, the gas fraction of the galaxy. Uh, so the, the ratio between the gas and uh, essentially the stars uh, of the, that you have in the disk. Now, uh, the... Uh, this expression uh, immediately shows that the higher is the accretion rate, the higher is sigma. Uh, and in fact, for the cosmological accretion that, that we uh, introduced before, then you can see that uh, sigma uh, as an expression that can be written like this. Again, normalize it to a halo of 10 to the 12 solar masses at redshift seven, then you find out that uh, the sigma is very large. So of the order of 100 kilometers per second. So again, I'm always going back to my example of the Milky Way at redshift seven. Now, sigma, the velocity dispersion, uh, is much higher than, uh, than you would expect for all that you- Andrea? Expect. Yes. Um, and it's just some clarification questions. I think you will be quick to answer yes. um, to not lose too many people here. Sure. Some people were wondering what is FG and then um, the sound yes. speed, how is it defined and how is it related yes. to pressure? Because yes. that has come up a few times. Absolutely. So uh, Fg is the gas fraction, which is the ratio between the, uh, the gas mass and uh, let me say the total gas, or the total mass of the disk, which includes uh, stars and uh, dark matter. But you can forget about dark matter at the scale of the disk. We are totally dominated by the baryon. So essentially the Fg is the ratio of uh, gas mass over uh, uh, total mass, which is stars plus gas. Okay, so it's the gas fraction. And uh, the sound speed, um, it's uh, essentially the pressure is related to the sound speed like rho cs squared. Okay, so the pressure is proportional to the uh, sound speed squared. And the sound speed essentially it's uh, purely uh, determined by the temperature of the gas as the square root of that. So these are uh, <coughs> standard uh, thermodynamics. All right, good. So uh, the gas velocity dispersion of uh, uh, high redshift galaxies are uh, relatively high and certainly much higher than what you would expect from a uh, normal galaxy. And this is again, a reflection of the fact that the, um, that the accretion rate is very high. Now, once the gas is in the disk, it, uh, it cools as I was mentioning before, and we know that uh, uh, the gas tends to divide into two different phases, uh, depending on the uh, on the 
properties of the of the cooling function. So now these are two examples of uh, the cooling function uh, and the contribution to the cooling uh, of the gas by different species. And for two cases, uh, two, two uh, representative uh, phases of the, of the ISM, a warm neutral gas or a cold neutral gas. And in particular, the warm neutral gas is 0.6, uh, in this case has been uh, set to 0.6 particle per cubic centimeter. And, in, and for the cold, 20 particle per cubic centimeter. In any case, uh, it doesn't make uh, much of a difference. You see that in both cases, uh, the two, uh, the, the cooling is dominated by two fine structure lines, the carbon two line at 158 microns and the 60, the oxygen one at 63 uh, microns. So these are the two lines that uh, uh, provide the cooling and this will be important in terms of observation and phenomenology as I will come uh, towards the end of my lecture. Now, uh, uh, the fact that there are these two phases is uh, intrinsically uh, related to a process that is called the thermal instability. So uh, these are, uh, the, the gas naturally tends to uh, separate in two different uh, phases that we typically call uh, the warm neutral uh, gas and the cold neutral gas, which are in uh, uh, pressure equilibrium among them. So just concentrate on the, on the, bottom, on the bottom figure here. Okay, so I'm showing here the temperature versus the pressure. Okay, and so uh, the line represents the, uh, the, uh, the curve on which the eating exactly balances the cooling. So you have eating produced by, for example, uh, UV radiation, cosmic rays, whatever you have, and the cooling function uh, is given by the different. Uh, the function that I showed you before. So on the on the left here, you have uh, the gas tends to heat up. On the on the right, the gas tends to cool down. And so uh, if you set the given pressure, which is set essentially by gravity, the, the, the gravity of the galaxy itself in the disk. So you find that there are two there are two solutions. If you draw a vertical line, you find two solutions. One which corresponds to relatively high temperatures. 8,000, the one which corresponds to roughly 100 or 200 K, which is the cold neutral medium. And so you get this curves from the eating cooling equilibrium curves. And uh, so this is the reason for which the gas is multi-phase, so it contains different phases because there are more than one uh, stable equilibrium point uh, that defines the warm and the neutral, the, the neutral uh, medium. But this is because the pressure, it happens that, for example, in the Milky Way, and these are calculations that refer to the Milky Way, uh, the Milky Way happens to have a, a, a pressure in terms of P over K, uh, that is about uh, 4,000, okay? So if, for example, you had a, a pressure, which is 9,000, then you would only have one phase, which is the cold phase, or vice versa, if it were 1,000, the pressure was 1000 in these units, then it would have been only uh, a single phase, a single warm phase uh, would exist. So this is important. And this is important, particularly again, at high redshift, because now these are uh, results from numerical simulations. And uh, here I'm showing, uh, look at the, again, at the right uh, end plot. Again, this pressure versus density. You see that uh, as as you are at the uh, low uh, low densities, maybe you can have some uh, some sort of multi-phase uh, structure. This S curve that I was showing before. But as you go to uh, to the the regions that are uh, more characterizing the ISM of these galaxies, so the, the diffuse and dense uh, parts with densities 10 or 100 particle per cc, uh, then the pressure is much higher and there is no uh, double structure anymore. So uh, the and this is because the pressures in, the, in these early galaxies, because they are more compact, they have uh, large uh, accretion uh, rates, so they collect a lot of gas and the pressure builds up. And as the pressure builds up, then we are losing this uh, multi-phase structure and the, uh, the, ten the gas tends to collect into uh, the cold uh, neutral phase. 
For comparison, I'll set here the range of uh, pressure for the Milky Way, but you see that at the same density, the pressure of uh, that we find, at least in simulations, in this very in this high redshift galaxy is about 100 times larger than, than the Milky Way. So these are very high pressure systems. Now, uh, now you may ask now, uh, what Just is let the... you know you are. Yes. Um, 55 minutes and 35 minutes left or something like this. Yes, uh, so uh, I'm going. Uh, I'm going a little bit slow. So, but uh, let me let me uh, take this point. So uh, we can also compute the uh, this vertical equilibrium, uh, and so by using assuming that the disk in hydrostatic equilibrium, this is very simple uh, calculation actually that shows that the uh, essentially the thickness of the disk is proportional to the velocity dispersion divided by omega. Then you can look up the derivation uh, in the slides that, that I leave with you. But the important thing is that the thickness is proportional to the velocity dispersion over the uh, uh, rotational frequency that is V over R. So uh, the, the larger is sigma, the more thicker are the disks. So the disks are supported by, by turbulence. So why do we care about that? Well, we care about that because when we get to the uh, issue of star formation, and this is the famous Kennica Schmidt law that relates the sigma star formation rate to the uh, sigma uh, surface density of the gas, then we see there is a very uh, nice correlation that is proportional to sigma g to 1.4. For both for spirals, for uh, disks, and also for starbursts uh, with a slight uh, displacement. But then you can see that uh, even at redshift that are between 0.5 and 2.3, we still have uh, a nice uh, linear, well, uh, power law relation between these two quantities. Now, can we explain this in simple terms? Well, yes, we can. Um, because we can explain, we can understand this uh, Kennica Schmidt relation using the, the disk models that we have developed so far. And so uh, the observation tell us that the molecular gas forms stars at a rate which is about 1% of its mass per free fall time. So we can use what we have and uh, uh, write then we can use this information and say that the uh, surface star formation rate is proportional to the sigma gas to some efficiency, which we take to be 1%, divided by the free fall time. And the, the free fall time is one over G rho. The gas density, we take it from the uh, argument that I used before, because we know the uh, thickness of the disk. So we can get the uh, number density, or actually the, uh, the gas density, by dividing the surface density over H. And with the uh, expression that we had before, that you can check again later uh, for sigma and omega, we find that the density also is proportional to one per redshift to the uh, 11.4 at fixed halo mass. So the theory from this simple formula is telling us that uh, sigma dot star should increase like sigma g to the three halves. And then there is a factor which depends on redshift to the uh, power 3.8, 3.8. The data, the figure that I showed before, shows that, again, uh, star formation rate density uh, depends on sigma g to uh, power 1.4, which is very close to the 1.5 that we are getting here, times a coefficient. And you see that this coefficient is uh, proportional to redshift. So that means that high redshift galaxies are denser and they're also likely to be more bursty that means that they have this uh, parameter Ks, which I call the burstiness parameters, is higher. So as you go to high redshift, the coefficient in the Kennecke Schmidt law increases with redshift. So this is another reason for which galaxies are different. And also they have larger interstellar radiation field compared to the Milky Way because they have more star formation rate per unit area. So let me uh, recap and uh, then break. So what did we learn so far about the, the differences between uh, early galaxies and the uh, present day galaxies? So cosmology plays a major role by uh, determining uh, uh, or forcing this galaxy to a smaller radii and larger accretion rate. 
In turn, smaller radii imply that you have larger uh, surface star formation rate and larger UV interstellar radiation field. Or both are important for star formation and for the properties of the ISM. On the other hand, larger accretion rate imply that you have larger velocity dispersions and larger velocity dispersion, uh, velocity dispersion participates into the uh, equilibrium of the, of the disks uh, that uh, and to imply larger, uh, more bursty galaxies, so larger KS, larger densities, and larger pressure. So these are, the, in one slide, these are all the, uh, the uh, differences between early galaxies and present day galaxies, which also determine the, the differences in their uh, ISM. And now I want to break here and a question for five minutes, if you have, uh, before we go and analyze what these differences imply for the interstellar mission. Uh, okay, thank you, Andra. Um, maybe you can leave your summary slide. That was very nice. Um, yeah. uh, there are a few questions, and are we, it's very nice to see that people are interacting to the questions in threads. So maybe I will ask uh, about the first part uh, about the head of uh, growth. Is there um, the possibility that uh, a large initial overdensity to lead to the formation of supermassive black hole? Um, yes, this is possible uh, at least in two ways. Uh, the first, if you have this uh, very large overdensities during the radiation dominated epoch, so very early on in the epoch in, during uh, cosmic evolution, then this, uh, this perturbation can indeed collapse in what is called primordial uh, black hole. So you form directly a black hole. And uh, this is interesting because you could, uh, in principle, either produce the seeds for the supermassive black hole that we see uh, today, or also to produce intermediate mass black holes, which are uh, possibly uh, uh, needed in order to, to interpret the uh, LIGO-Virgo uh, gravitational wave detections. And another question on this is related to the buildup on the growth um, of dark matters and on the buildup of the angular momentum. So regarding the tidal torque theory, why is it believed that dark matter heroes acquire angular momentum only after realization and not so much afterwards? After realization? After uh, verialization. Oh, realization, sorry. Uh, well, uh, truly speaking, there is uh, there, there is uh, the, the possibility that this uh, anchor momentum it start to build up from the very beginning. It's not necessarily only during the nonlinear phase. Uh, of course, the effects are much more important during the nonlinear phase because gravitational fields are more enhanced, and therefore the interaction among objects are much more uh, powerful than they are during the linear regime because the uh, the essentially the gravitational potential is it's lower at that time than it is when it is in the nonlinear phase. So it's a continuous process, but it's it's very well uh, approximated by the effects that you see in the nonlinear regime only. And then on the second part of your uh, presentation on the stability of disk and the large dispersions predicted by the large accretion rates. Um, especially at Redshift 7. And here there's a quite a bit of discussion in this thread. It's like um, uh, they want you to comment on the observations of um, galaxies at Redshift 4 with low or a sigma or high V over sigma. Yes. So what um, do you think is happening there? Yeah, uh, this is a very interesting, very interesting problem that uh, challenges this view. I, I agree um, because the, apparently there are there are galaxies that uh, are able to, in some sense, dissipate very rapidly this uh, sigma. Um, that uh, in some ways, so it may be due that the sigma dissipated. Uh, several reasons that we are not fully uh, understanding. It could be dissipated due to uh, supersonic turbulence, uh, but then uh, this energy must come out somewhere else. So it's an interesting, very interesting question. Actually, this is a discovery that we are making these days. Uh, and uh, so we would expect from theory that sigma should be 
should be higher and therefore the disc should be rather uh, roundish. But in fact, we do see uh, the sum disc at least uh, are relatively thin and that means that this sigma has been dissipated. How exactly? Uh, it's a mystery so far. No, I, don't, I don't think that anybody has a final answer. So it's an open problem. Okay, I think these were the uh, um, primary points right now. So maybe you can continue. Sure, thank you. So now, uh, uh, now the ISM. So, uh, so far we have learned what are the differences among uh, early galaxies and present day ones. But how do we study them? Well, uh, the best way, the, the, the window that has opened in the last few years uh, to study uh, the interstellar medium of uh, high redshift galaxy essentially comes from, uh, but not exclusively, but certainly it's been very important uh, to uh, being able to use the power of far infrared lines that I uh, assume you're all very familiar with. So uh, the, uh, this is a spectrum that I'm showing the, in the top plot with uh, the dust thermal emission that is producing the infrared uh, overall gray body uh, emission uh, around uh, 100 microns in west frame. And on top of, on top of that, there are the uh, interstellar lines that uh, produce the cooling of the gas. And they, they do, for example, the one that I discussed before, which are the two most, most important are the carbon two line and the oxygen, oxygen one, uh, at least in the Milky Way, they are the most important one. Um, and then, uh, but there are others, there are also the uh, oxygen three, nitrogen two, and, uh, and so on and so forth, there are even others. And so when we look at a galaxy, we can, uh, we can look at, uh, at this galaxy in different lines, and for example, this example from a local galaxy, DDO155, uh, that is seen in, in several uh, lines, also in H1, and then also the uh, ultraviolet and uh, optical uh, HR and, and B. So uh, these lines provide us a lot of uh, indications on the uh, thermal balance and the energy exchange among phases in the interstellar medium. So they are very useful. They can all, we can also use them to uh, study in very much detail uh, star forming regions. And this is a local one, Oreo MC1, uh, which you see a beautiful carbon two, uh, 158 uh, maps with uh, very high resolution that uh, allow us to see the very uh, details of the, uh, of the star forming region. So of course we cannot do this at high redshift, but we can learn from uh, this type of observation and, uh, and physics in order to be able to trans transport it uh, to high redshift. Now, uh, carbon two, uh, as, as, as for the reason that I explained, is the most important uh, uh, cooling line in the ISM, and it's, it is expected to be related to star formation rate. So how can we convince ourselves of that? This is very simple, uh, because uh, the uh, if you have a galaxy, you have stars, they emit UV, and uh, this UV uh, is absorbed by uh, by dust grains, and uh, uh, exactly as it is done for an atom, the, the dust grain emits uh, an, elect uh, an electron, a photoelectron that thermalizes its energy in the ISM and therefore provides some heating. So the heating rate of this, of this uh, process is given by this simple expression where epsilon is an efficiency, which is on the order of 5%. Uh, G tilde, it's the ratio of the UV field in the uh, hubbing band, which is between 6 eV and 13.6 13, 13 eV. And uh, so G0 is the hubbing value, so it's a normalization value. And uh, if you say that you can easily uh, scale this, the intensity of the radiation field with the star formation rate, it's a linear relation essentially, apart from details. So you can read G tilde as the star formation rate essentially. And then we have the density of the gas, the number density of hydrogen atoms. So the, uh, this is the heating. So we have to balance it with the cooling and the cooling is essentially the, uh, has to balance the, the heating per volume. So we have our expression for gamma and uh, uh, the volume is simply, uh, okay, let me uh, step back. So we have, uh, we can write NH as uh, the sigma of the gas, the surface density of the gas divided the scale height H. Remember that we obtain it from the uh, assumption of hydrostatic equilibrium. And then 
we multiply by the volume, which is uh, the disk radius times the scale height. So you see that nicely this simplifies into, uh, into this, uh, into this expression. And uh, uh, basically you can compute the carbon two luminosity from here. And so the carbon two luminosity turns out to be uh, a value, which is 2.4 10 to the nine uh, times the, uh, the cosmological barrier to dark matter ratio, which I think could be 0 0.15 times the fraction of those barriers that are residing in a halo that collapse it into a disk. So it's not all the or not all the variants in the disk collapse into the disk itself. They may remain uh, a little bit outside the galaxy, what is called a circumgalactic medium. And uh, M is the halo mass in units of 10 to the 12 solar masses per year, times, uh, sorry, 10 to the 12 solar masses and star formation rates is the star formation rate in solar masses per year. So this is the expected luminosity of the carbon two, and that should correlate with the star formation rate. So a linear relation. This is what we expect from theory. This is what we see from the data, okay? And this is for high redshift galaxies, redshift larger than six, larger than five, sorry. Uh, so locally, the relation holds, and uh, it has a coefficient 10 to the seven uh, per star formation rate. Uh, this is what has been observed, and this is what we observe instead at, uh, at high redshift. So at high redshift, these are all the galaxies that we, for which we have carbon-2 uh, observations as a function of their star formation rates. We also have upper limits, but most importantly, uh, we see that many galaxies show what is called the uh, carbon-2 deficit, so they lie below this line. Now, um, the, this is a this is an interesting problem. So uh, that uh, makes the interstellar medium of high redshift galaxy different from the one of uh, present day ones. And so, uh, can we uh, do a, a, a slightly uh, uh, next a small step forward with respect to the simple expectation that we had before? So we can build up a physical model. And uh, uh, you can find all the details here in my paper two years ago. Uh, essentially, what happens? So if you have your radiation field that is produced by the star in your disk, and uh, uh, you shine onto, onto the, the disk. So now assume that this is the mid-plane. So you have the stars at the mid-plane. You have a stintellar disk. And then you have your uh, column density of gas, which is the, 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 disk in, the disk itself, that you are irradiating with the stars. So uh, the disk has a total column density N0. And so as the star shine, both ionizing and non-ionizing photons, you will form uh, an ionized region first um, uh, with the temperature 10 to the four, then a neutral region with temperature 10 to the two, and then some dark region, which has the temperature of the CMB. And as I told you before, this is important when you go to high reg. Now, uh, there are several, uh, the, 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 the separation between these this different regions is given essentially by uh, the uh, radiative transfer equation. Um, and uh, essentially, this is the set, uh, this is the equivalent of the Strongren length. So, the, the length of which the uh, optical depth to ionizing photon is equal to one, modulated by the fact uh, there is also dust. So, the, you have to assume that the photons are not only absorbed by hydrogen, but also by the dust. And that's why we have this uh, uh, column density Ni, which is slightly different from the classical dust free Strongren length. Um, and then we have uh, uh, another point where, where essentially the UV flux goes to zero, okay? And this is related also to the uh, dust absorption and to the uh, consequent decrease, decrease of the UV flux to zero. So there are different scales here that are important. And so basically you can draw uh, a diagram like this that allows you to compute the, uh, the carbon two emission. So concentrate first on the formula that is on the bottom here. So the carbon two is the sum of two components in, uh, of the ionized part in the slab and also the neutral part of the slab. And so the different contribution depend essentially on how fra uh, what fraction of the, of the slab is ionized. And here in the plot, I'm showing uh, essentially, uh, I given the answer in terms of the column density of the, of the, of the gas, 
versus the, uh, the dust content, which I parameterize in terms of the uh, dust to gas ratio. So in this plane, you can, uh, you can see that there are the three regions that I discussed before. So the ionized region that occupies the low column density part, then we have the neutral region, uh, and then there is the dark region. Um, of course, all this, this is just uh, to make an example of how these different regions may depend on the different parameters of different uh, scales of the, of the column density. So it's a little bit complicated to understand. I don't want to go into the details. If you're interested in to uh, study the model, you can go to the paper. But what is important here is that you can predict exactly what is the, uh, from first principle, essentially, the flux of uh, carbon to uh, that you would expect from a given galaxy with different uh, properties. So a galactic disk with different uh, uh, properties in terms of the uh, sigma gas and all the sigma velocity dispersion, all the things that we have discussed so far. So this is very simple and, and powerful. Now, what is the, what is the uh, answer to that? Well, the, 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 uh, now we are putting together the, uh, the uh, everything in a single slide. Again, this is the carbon two versus star formation rate relation. And so the curves here, are the, uh, the uh, prediction from the model um, and their color in terms of the uh, intensity of the uh, ionizing field, if you like, so the uh, ionization parameter U. Now, what do we see? First of all, let me go step by step. So this is the standard local relation that, that, that we were discussing before. So the essentially the linear relation between carbon two and uh, sigma star formation rate. Uh, and uh, we note that uh, these points here are the uh, local galaxies, while the, uh, the, the circles are the high redshift galaxy that I showed you in the previous plot. So the three curves refer to, uh, uh, sorry, uh, so first of all, we notice a separation between the high redshift, which tend to have a large sigma star formation rate, according to what we deduced before in the first part of the lecture, while at low redshift, uh, we have uh, uh, that the star formation rates per unit area are smaller. So low redshift galaxies and high redshift galaxies live in two completely separate regimes. Uh, and so metallicity also plays a role because it determines the, uh, the amount of uh, carbon that you have in your gas. So depending on the metallicity, you would expect a relation which it's approximately uh, linear, uh, but then it saturates as you go to very large, uh, very large luminosity. Now you see that even the data, if you look at the data more closely, you see that uh, it's not really fitting a simple linear relation, but it has some curvature here, even for the at low ratio. And this is probably catched by, by uh, the model. So now, uh, the, this is the this is what we uh, expect for uh, uh, if you use a, uh, for the galaxy a relation between uh, sigma gas and sigma star formation or a Kanika Smith relation, which is the standard one. But I told you before that uh, this Ks, which you remember is the coefficient in front of the that is entering the Kanika Smith relation, the, co the coefficient in front of sigma to the uh, 1.4, if you like, so the burstiness parameter. So uh, as an important role, not only, uh, so this is for uh, if the galaxy are assumed to be on the local Kanika Smith relation. But in fact, if you, if you go to, uh, instead, uh, if you move from the same plot, Ks equal one to Ks equal five, then you see that uh, the galaxies move towards uh, uh, a region where the, uh, they are deficient in carbon too, because they are uh, more burstiness. So starburst galaxies, as the one that you expect at high redshift, are also expected to be carbon two faint. And this is because compared to the amount of stars they form, they have little gas to produce the carbon two emission. And so that is the reason for which they are uh, carbon too faint, at least this is the way in which the model explains it. Now, this model, it's a, it's a simple one, but all this is also, uh, you can do the same with uh, numerical simulations and we did so. Uh, so this is the same graph now, uh, sigma carbon two versus star formation rate uh, per unit area, 
uh, and this is a result from, from the simulation. So the, the uh, diagonal line here is again, the local Deleuze relation, and this is the prediction from the uh, simulation. And you see that it fits on the galaxy that we observe with good approximation. And then it also saturates as you go to high um, uh, star formation rates per unit area for the reason that I explained. So it looks like that uh, we understand why uh, most of these galaxies that I read should tend to become uh, carbon to deficient. Now, uh, of course, simulation, as you've seen, uh, are very useful to understand many uh, other issues concerning the, uh, the CMB. And so uh, we typically, in order to do this, though, you need to uh, resort to, uh, if you want to resolve the uh, properties of the interstellar medium, you need to resolve to so-called zoom simulations in which you do uh, you resolve a very uh, small spatial scales of the order of 10 parsecs or so and then you have to include as much physics as you can in terms of uh, chemistry uh, and uh, dust and also radiative transfer uh, possibly on the fly so if you do all this then you can get things like uh, like these ones, uh, and here I'm zooming from the large scale. You see the filaments that we were discussing before. Of course, the situation is much more complicated than the simple analytical consideration that we were doing at the very beginning. But nevertheless, you know, uh, order of magnitude, uh, even those considerations con continue to hold very nicely, even for these complex uh, simulations. So, in fact, you see a disk, right? If you zoom down to uh, scales of the order of uh, a few hundred parsecs or less, then you see that there is a disk. And uh, uh, in this case, it's a nice disk with some clumps here, maybe satellites or merger galaxies. And uh, the gas is uh, sitting in this disk, uh, which nevertheless, as uh, uh, typically find, we find that the metallicities are relatively high already at the very beginning. So the galaxies have reached very rapidly. And this is a fortune because then we can use uh, these uh, heavy elements to observe the lines that they produce. And I was mentioned before, you can build uh, mock maps in terms of uh, carbon two or nitrogen two or oxygen three uh, from, from these galaxies. And then you can compare them with uh, with the uh, simulation, with the observations, and you can link directly these uh, observed properties to the physical properties in terms of uh, uh, the gas density or molecular gas density, ionization field, the interstellar radiation field, whatever you're interested in. Now, uh, for uh, when you are at high redshift, something that you need to take into account carefully is the effect, uh, the effects of the CMB. Um, and the CMB indeed um, uh, sets uh, essentially, because you're observing the galaxy against the CMB, uh, then uh, you need to have some contrast between the galaxy and the CMB. Otherwise, you cannot disentangle the galaxy or your source from the CMB itself. So this contrast is essentially uh, given by, in terms of the intensity, uh, for inerts per second per square, cent per square centimeter per hertz, uh, in terms of the difference between the uh, emission of, from the source, which is given by uh, the, uh, essentially the, the, the black body at the spin uh, temperature, which are properly defined as the spin temperature, or and the, uh, and the CMB itself times uh, the optical depth uh, correction. Now you can define uh, a flux ratio and the flux ratio uh, between is what you observe uh, with respect to what is the uh, intrinsic emission from the galaxy. For example, if you're looking at the carbon two line, uh, this will, the numerator is the uh, observed flux of the carbon two line with respect to what you would see if the CMB was not there. And so you can rewrite from the previous formula, this eta of the flux ratio as one minus the ratio of the uh, the black body at the CMB temperature and the black body at the uh, spin temperature. What is the spin temperature? 
well, the spin temperature is not in as uh, a smart way to write the uh, ratio of the level population of the two levels that are producing the carbon two line. And so there's an upper level, which is the 2P three halves, and the lower level, which is the 2P one half. And the difference is essentially the uh, temperature corresponding to the excitation of the line, 91.2 Kelvin. Now, uh, the, this thing, uh, the ratio NU over NL, is given by uh, the detailed balance of many uh, physical processes. And uh, you can have, as usual, the uh, stimulated absorption, the collision line excitation with electrons or with uh, hydrogen atoms. And then on the denominator, you have the stimulated emission, spontaneous emission, or the Einstein coefficients, and collision, the excitation by electrons or, uh, or hydrogen. So if you uh, work out this, then you can derive uh, the TS, the spin temperature, uh, that is the level population. And therefore you can understand by how much your uh, flux is uh, uh, essentially uh, uh, decreased by the presence of the CMB. Of course, if from this formula, you see that if the spin temperature goes to the CMB temperature, the contrast would be zero and the object would be unobservable. It would be uh, impossible to disentangle it from, from the CMB. So the flux ratio uh, gives you by how much you're losing uh, of the uh, flux from that source because you're observing it against the CMB. So you can plot this uh, uh, flux decrease ratio here as a function of the density of the gas uh, in particle per uh, cubic centimeter. There is also some dependence of the coefficients uh, of the Einstein coefficient of temperature, which is weaker though. Uh, but so if we look at the eta versus density, you see that uh, small values of eta means that the flux is very much decreased. And uh, as you approach one, Essentially, there is no uh, absorption or, sorry, no de, uh, de decrement of the flux uh, at all. So you see that in general, when you go to very low densities uh, below, say, 10, the flux can be decreased by, uh, by uh, considerable amounts, up to 90% of the flux. Uh, it's uh, uh, undetectable. And so when you observe galaxies, if you lose uh, a high redshift, if you lose 90% of your flux, you are a little bit in trouble. Uh, fortunately, uh, the flux that you're losing comes from predominantly from the low density parts of the galaxy. So let me show you an example, of, again, uh, resorting to uh, simulations. So uh, these are a, a, a simulated galaxy uh, seen either face on in the, in the top, top row or edge on in the bottom row. Um, and on the left column, I'm showing the carbon to surface density. So there's the density of the ion, okay? So the ion, uh, see the carbon two is very, uh, it's mostly concentrated in, in the disc, but there's also this, uh, uh, CGM or external gas that you, that you may, uh, however you call it, uh, that is uh, on much extended on much larger scales. Now, this is the distribution of the ion, either face on or, or edge on, but then you transform this into a carbon two line emission map. Then uh, you see that all this uh, low density gas that is uh, sitting uh, outside the uh, is sitting outside the main galaxy body has disappeared in the, in, the, in the actual image of the galaxy that you would see in the sky. Because that gas has such a low density that it goes in thermal equilibrium with the CMB and you lose that emission. So uh, now uh, this is an important uh, effect and uh, limits the, the uh, ability to, for example, to detect uh, carbon two at very large distances from the galaxies or uh, in external in external uh, parts of, of the galaxy anyway. Uh, most of the carbon two is instead coming from uh, the uh, from the region or high density regions of the disk, and uh, we find that ninety five percent of the emission is collocated with the with uh, the molecular the molecular disk. So the 
remember that these galaxies are very dense, very compact, so and typically have a single phase, uh, the single cold phase. So uh, because of the, they are so compact that the gas uh, very it likes to be turned into uh, molecular form due to due to the uh, high density. So their molecular fraction is very high. Now. If this is true, then uh, we have to care about uh, uh, molecular clouds, and uh, this is uh, uh, an overall representation of the uh, of the internal of the microphysics of uh, of a molecular cloud. Uh, that, in fact, uh, you may think of uh, that a molecular cloud at the center may have a, a no star, which is producing a hot bubble due to the winds that is emitting X-rays. The gas is hot, but then we have uh, an H2 region that emits a uh, free free and recombination line, temperature 10 to the four. And then we end in the PDR uh, that has uh, uh, more uh, uh, moderate temperatures uh, up to uh, a few thousand K, uh, which is where all these uh, cooling lines, the carbon two uh, and others are, are coming. Uh, and we can, uh, as I was showing before, uh, most of the lines come from these uh, the, this parts, some part of the uh, molecular molecular part of the of the disk itself. And then you go into the cold phase where uh, essentially there is no radiation. And you have uh, molecules and uh, very cold phase, uh, 10 to 100 K. So, uh, this is the what exactly what we also see in the uh, in the uh, simulation. So most of the carbon two and uh, and also oxygen one perhaps come from the uh, uh, from the dense part of the of the galaxy. So understanding early uh, molecular clouds is important. And so uh, how do we uh, let's go back one step to uh, to the theory. So uh, the molecular clouds, and uh, we'll see what are the implications of having a large velocity dispersion in these galaxies. So we can define the virial parameter, which I think you're all very familiar with, and uh, which is essentially a, a different way to uh, set the uh, equilibrium between uh, gravity and uh, support by turbulence. Um, local observations show that these values of the order of one, say, and then you can write down how the mass and the radius of the molecular cloud depend on the velocity dispersion of the gas. Remember that this is high in, uh, in uh, high redshift galaxies uh, and, uh, and the pressure P. If then you say that star formation rate is uh, an efficiency again, as we've done before, uh, and times the mass over the free fall time, you find a nice formula that says that the star formation rate is purely proportional to the cube of the uh, turbulent uh, velocity. So the star formation, because the sigma is high in high galaxies, as we have learned, then the star formation rate uh, is also, uh, the, the efficiency of the star formation rate is very high. So uh, the, the star formation rate in, in these clouds is uh, typically, sorry, is very, is very uh, large. Yeah, you can also uh, check that the uh, the dispersal time depends on on the, the time that uh, in which the cloud is destroyed. Essentially, depends on on sigma cube because the feedback is proportional to the star formation rate, and therefore it's natural to understand that the clouds uh, at uh, uh, large sigma uh, depend on t uh, on sigma to the cube. And you can define the efficiency, but this is a detail. Now, uh, the fact that uh, you can now put a plot or produce a plot like this one, in which you put you compare uh, molecular clouds at high redshift, which is the red star, or one in a Milky Way, and you this plane is sigma versus the pressure in the galaxy in the galactic disk. So, if we have very large sigma, and uh, this is a for example a distribution of sigma in a high redshift galaxy from a simulation. So it peaks around uh, 15 kilometer per second, say slightly, well, two or three times higher than, than the, uh, the, the Milky Way itself. So um, in, uh, at high redshift, uh, so the, the uh, sigma is larger and therefore the survival time of the clouds is larger as well. So it's about 10 million years compared to the blue star, which lies on the curve of 2.3 million years, which is the local one. So the fact that GMC lived longer 
means that the star formation rate at high redshift is more obscure. So it remains obscure for a longer time. And this uh, radiation, the radiation from the stars remain trapped into the, into the molecular clouds and eventually is absorbed by dust and re-emitted by uh, in the infrared. So you, because of that, uh, you would expect that therefore the uh, high redshift galaxies are better infrared emitters than they are the uh, low redshift one. And all this boils down to the differences in sigma which then boils down to the cosmological uh, arguments that uh, I uh, discussed at the very beginning of the of the uh, of the talk. Uh, I have other material in the in the slides, but uh, uh, they are there for uh, your inspection. Uh, I prefer to stop here and get your uh, question now, as we have ten minutes left, um, and so. Uh, but if you have uh, additional questions, also materials that are, that are not uh, able to cover today, uh, please uh, feel free to send me questions also on things that I've not said today. So I'll stop here. Thank you, Andrea. It was a very nice uh, overview of the formation of the ISM of the first galaxies or the formation of the first ISM in galaxies. Yeah, um, thank you. <laughs> Um, there are many, uh, many questions, so people are, have been very interested in your presentation. I'm not going to be able to cover them all, um, but one perhaps um, is to do with the um, relation between the baryonic size and the halo size. You introduced a spin parameter for the specific angular momentum of the halos. Yes. The question is, does this quantity affect the structure of the baryons inside the halo? Yes, of course, because if you uh, if you have a smaller disk uh, for a fixed uh, halo mass and therefore also a fixed amount of baryons, remember that at the beginning uh, when the uh, halo forms, it tends to be formed with the same cosmological ratio of baryons to dark matter, which is roughly uh, one over seven. And so... Um, Basically, because you are compressing the same amount of material in a smaller disk, then the densities become higher, and the density become higher, the pressure become higher, and then the gas tends to uh, to, to turn into a, a molecular form because densities are so high, then uh, you easily form uh, molecular hydrogen. It has to be said that in order to form efficiently molecular hydrogen you need to have some dust grains uh, to catalyze the formation of molecular hydrogen. On the other hand, uh, there are also ways to form it slightly less efficiently also in the gas phase. And we know for sure that, that the first stars that formed didn't have dust grains to, to use. And therefore, uh, it must be possible, although less efficient, to form molecular hydrogen also in conditions of very low uh, metallicity. Maybe, maybe um, I think the question was slightly different. Uh, at a fixed mass, at a fixed halo mass, um, a change in the halo spin would impact uh -huh. the variant or? Oh, yes. I mean, if you change lambda, as I said, lambda, it's, uh, it's uh, log, uh, log normally distributed. And therefore, uh, not all galaxies with the same uh, uh, halo mass have the same lambda. So there is a statistical probability that you get uh, a larger or, or lower uh, spin parameter, and of course, if you if you change that, then the the uh, this gradient will change accordingly, and and the properties of the gas will change accordingly. So that that this is one of the ways in which cosmology very much impacts uh, on the internal structure of a galaxy. Yes, the answer is yes. Okay, um, there's another question on the Kennicott Schmidt law. Um, um, where at low gas density, the slope seems to be steeper. Uh, is that something that is supported by, by theory? And that what are the implications of that? Um, you mean from uh, the slope between starburst and normal galaxies? Or sorry, which? which at low, at low uh, gas density, surface density. Ah, OK. So uh, let, let me check. Um, yes, at low, at, oh, wait, it was, sorry. I'm trying to get this slide, but I'm, I'm missing it. Uh, so it was early. Uh, in, just to make it, 
quicker. Yeah, I think that uh, uh, you refer that the question refers to this change in the slope here. Yes. Oh yes. So this is uh, this is a regime in which you go to very uh, small object essentially with very low surface densities, and uh, and therefore at that point the the relation steepens because although you have gas, you cannot form efficiently molecular hydrogen and 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 therefore high density regions uh, which this task can form. So you have gas, but it's very too much diffused in order to be able to. Um, to, to form stars. That's why the efficiency decreases and the, and the relation steepens, but these are you know, relatively small objects uh, and, uh, and, and certainly it does not apply to, to uh, high redshift because as I showed you before, the, the sigma, uh, the surface density of gas in these very high redshift galaxies are much higher in a regime where this effect is not really uh, important. Um, then there's a question on um, the C plus line. You presented some nice models for um, this, this the star formation, um, but the question is related to the kinematic properties. So would would these properties, the velocity sigma derived from far infrared lines, be similar to the ones from CO and H alpha? Ah, that that's a very uh... Nice question because, of course, when you, uh, for example, I, I can comment uh, on the uh, on the velocity dispersion that you may get from uh, uh, carbon two, for example, versus H alpha. H alpha traces uh, a, a ionized gas, which is uh, who knows is probably produced certainly uh, ionized by either uh, radiation or also may trace an outflow and uh, so this gas is a, a dynamics which is certainly different with respect to the molecular I, I tried to convince you that most of the carbon of the carbon two line is produced in dense uh, kind of molecular but even though they're not molecular they're atomic uh, dense clouds anyway let me call them generally molecular clouds even though they only refer to a part of them uh, so the carbon 2 comes from this cold dense regions the h alpha comes from the uh, rarefied uh, ionized perhaps warm uh, warmer regions and therefore, you would expect that the velocity dispersion that you measure in H alpha are larger than what you observe in, uh, in carbon two. Um, and so the question is where, is, where is most of the gas residing? Is it in the cold part or in the uh, diffuse one? Typically, we find that it's in the cold part. So I think that carbon two is a more fair tracer of the uh, velocity dispersion than it is H alpha. Thank you. Um, then the question by Elena on this on this slide in particular, I think, as the O3 surface brightness has a large halo there. Um, so she's wondering what's causing this halo. Yeah, this is a this is exactly it's an ionization cone because there are regions where the uh, UV flux. Maybe you can also see it uh, from here in the, in the top in the top panel. Because essentially, uh, oxygen three is produced where the uh, ionizing photons are present. It's a it's a, a species a species that you find in ionized regions, and you see that this galaxy uh, as a cone. Now the inclination is not the same, unfortunately, but uh, this cone here that is emerging from the galaxy and the ionization parameter. So this cone here is what you see here in a different geometrical perspective, but it's essentially produced by the fact that there are regions through which um, uh, intermittently uh, ionizing photons can escape from, from, the, from the central body of the galaxy. It's not clear whether they escape from the virial radius too, because look at the scales here. We are the very central part of the galaxy. This is 0.5 kiloparsec. So here it could be maybe two or three kiloparsec at most while the virial radius of this galaxy is about 20 kiloparsecs. So, but clearly this corresponds to uh, regions where you have uh, an outburst of uh, ionizing radiation that is producing oxygen-3 uh, in a diffuse manner that you see. And this is different from the, the small spots here that are the H2 regions where the, the, the ionized regions that are more uh, 
confined in around the old stars, or maybe they are younger, but there are other regions of the galaxy where you break through the galaxy and you produce a kind of a chimney of ionizing radiation that produces oxygen three. I have to say that um, if I remember correctly, these maps are not yet CMB corrected. Uh, and, and therefore maybe this uh, uh, purple area here of emission is there, but whether you can see it or not is unclear because of the CMB. And there are many other questions. Uh, maybe I will finish by a short one. So could you comment on the properties of these high Z galaxies compared to local dwarfs? Yes. Uh, well, this is a, um, a debate that, that goes on. Uh, uh, in the sense that can we consider the uh, low dwarf, the, the low redshift dwarfs as analogs of these high redshift galaxies? Well, yes and no. Uh, we have to be careful because uh, yes, in the sense that we can learn a lot from from on the interstellar medium in some regimes of, uh, for example, uh, high ionization parameters, strong uh, radiation fields, um, and but in general, these uh, early galaxies are different in the sense that although they have the same size, for example, they are much more denser, they have much more molecular hydrogen, they have much more um, uh, star formation, sorry, uh, supernova rate, which is much higher in the smaller region. So um, there are some, some things that, that resemble the, the, the early galaxies and some, some properties for which the local dwarfs are different. So they are good laboratories, but uh, we should uh, refrain from making a one-to-one -one connection. So we can learn about some things, provided that we keep in mind that the cosmology plays a role here when you go up and compare uh, to the early galaxies. Okay, thank you, uh, Andrea, for again this very nice presentation.